Good afternoon. I'm Susan Weber, and joining Walker and Dunlop CEO Willie Walker today is Amor Tolls to discuss the trials and tribulations he faced while pursuing his passion, how he finds inspiration, the steps of his writing process, the importance of being open to constructive feedback, and more. Thank you for joining us today. And now over to Willie. Thank you, Susan. And uh, good morning, everyone. I'm out on the West Coast today, and uh, it's a Real joy to have my old friend, uh, Amor Tolls, uh, with me today. Let me uh, jump into a quick bio, uh, and then Amor will jump into our discussion. Uh, born and raised in the Boston area, Amor Tolls graduated from Yale College and received an MA in English from Stanford University. Having worked as an investment professional for over 20 years, he now devotes himself full-time to writing in Manhattan, where he lives with his wife and two children. His novels, Rules of Civility, a Gentleman in Moscow and the Lincoln Highway have collectively sold more than 5 million copies and been translated into more than 30 languages. Amor and I have known one another almost our entire lives with our grandparents being friends, our parents being friends and his sister Kimbrough, brother Stokely and my brother Taylor spending long summer days on Martha's Vineyard together. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that Amor's uncle, Bob Doran, is one of my heroes and major mentors in how he built Wellington Management into the amazing company that it is today. So Amor, first of all, thank you uh, for joining me. And um, in, the, in the Lincoln Highway, which is about 18-year-old boys, um, as you say, that's the age when you fashion your future. Um, I knew you at age 18 as you were headed off to Yale. At that time, were you thinking about being an author, a banker, or a tennis pro? And I think I've got you on mute still. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great. And um, and how come I look so much older than you? <laughs> you said, you know, I've actually always you? I've actually always been younger than you, so it's all good. It, it, like that much, good. right? I mean, no, really, not it, much. Not much. Watch out for the next three years, Willie. Yeah. Um, in answer to your question, uh, I began writing fiction as a kid. Um, and so really I began, I became interested in writing fiction around the same time I learned how to read uh, in first grade. And so that became sort of my driving passion uh, from that point forward. I would read something, write something, read something, be influenced by it, write something, kind of write up through high school and into college and graduate school, as you mentioned. Um, so by the time I was 18 and I went to Yale, uh, you know, writing fiction, reading fiction were, was really at the top of the heap for me. Um, I certainly didn't imagine myself becoming involved in tennis because I wasn't good enough <laughs> compared to you. And, uh, and I certainly didn't think I was going to end up in the investment business either. Uh, I, I graduated from Stanford, having got my master's and moved to New York City with the intention of being a full-time novelist. Uh, back in 89. So on that, that's interesting, because what I, um, a lot of people wrote me asking, sort of, after getting your master's in English from Stanford, why you pursued a career in, in finance. And, and one piece of your history uh, that many may not know is that your father, Stokely, was a legendary banker at Brown Brothers Harriman. Was it your dad's influence or just sort of, if you will, <laughs> needing to make a buck that kind of got you into finance rather than pursuing your dreams of, of writing? Um, so I mean, it's a kind of a, a, a combination of things. I, 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 had, I had moved to New York City. I was 25 years old. I was living in an illegal uh, sublet in East Village uh, with another friend from our childhood, Claudio. And uh, I was writing fiction during the day, but feeling uh, claustrophobic, a little lonely, uh, a little frustrated. The work wasn't going very well. And, and I was broke. That was the other thing. So, so my father's influence comes in right away on that front, which was that he was not in favor of me writing fiction as a broke person. You know, he wasn't going to fund it himself. So, uh, so there's that influence. But, but you're you're right that um, uh, my father's uh, love of being in the investment arena, financial services, because you know he was a, a banker, as you mentioned, but he ultimately was really in the financial services, serving the mutual fund industry. That's in the, glo in the global custody business. Um, and my uncle, Bob Dorn, who you mentioned, uh, had been in the investment business his entire career and was an executive in the field. Uh, my godfather, uh, uh, in essence, uh, Sam Bodman, uh, who also, you know, you knew, 
was at the time at Fidelity. And uh, so I grew up around people who were in the financial services. And what I learned from that is that they were all having a great time in their fields. Like nobody was, was coming home, you know, frustrated, miserable. Uh, and I think it's because the field was so intellectually stimulating and they all worked in very collegial organizations. And so, uh, and there was of course growth and, you know, they're so a, a, a better than average compensation profile in, in the financial field, you know, particularly at the time. And, um, so for all these reasons, uh, you know, it, it was very, it's a very outgoing arena. Um, so when I was, uh, I realized I got to get a job. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to sit here in this dark room all day uh, with my roommate's cat. And um, so I kind of looked at my options and I was like, the way I thought of it was, you know, I had friends who were artists uh, who were doing the bartender waitressing thing. And uh, as a way of kind of funding time to do their art and my, my and I, I would look at them and they would all get home. Like my buddy who was a bartender, you know, he'd get home at two or three in the morning, you know, and, uh, you know, haven't had a grand old time. And, you know, sometimes he wouldn't come at home at all. And, uh, and he, you know, he, he was exhausted the next day. You know, he wasn't getting a lot of art done. And then, you know, I had friends in the, in the arts who would go and work in collateral jobs. So like if they, my friend who was a painter, answered phones at uh, the Castelli Galleries. And I had, you know, a friend who was a writer who was an assistant to an editor at a publishing house. And what I found with those, that those guys is that they, their, their jobs were not very I interesting uh, to them. Um, they were long, worked long hours, weren't paid very much. And by the time they got home, the last thing they wanted to do was their art. Because, you know, if you, if you spend your whole day reading manuscripts for your boss, and typing in front of a computer screen, the last thing you want to do go home was write fiction. So I was like, well, neither of these routes really seem to be working. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll, I'll do, I'll look for a job in the investment field. Uh, Cause as you say, my father loved it. My uncle loved it. My godfather loved it. And, uh, and I knew it was a research driven space and that, you know, appealed to me as a student of the humanities. So I began looking for work around that time or a little bit before, a little bit before this, a friend of mine had started his own investment firm and at this point, he was still working alone. And so, uh, you know, he ended up taking me in. Uh, and, you know, we used to joke that he said, you know, why don't you work with me until you get a job? And I just never got a job. And so 20 years you know, later, we were still working side by side, uh, uh, you know, in a thriving investment management business. And, and that was a great you know, career, uh, you know, as, but I, I knew that, um, and I loved it. I mean, the, I had great, we had great clients, we had a great practice and a great craft. Uh, great colleagues, the whole thing was great. And, um, but it was kind of, it was his dream, not my dream, right? So, um, so uh, along the way I knew I had to get myself back to writing fiction in my spare time, or I would end up miserable, uh, in, you know, emotionally, spiritually. So I began writing fiction again on the side. Uh, I spent seven years in my late twenties, early thirties, writing a novel I didn't like. So I set that aside. I learned a lot from that experience. And then I set about writing a novel based on what I had learned from that failed novel. And, uh, and Rules of Civility came out of that. And when that became a bestseller, I retired from the, from the firm. <laughs> Wait, so hang on a second. How did you learn from the first novel that you didn't publish in the sense that you wrote it, it maybe to you, did somebody else read it? Did you get feedback on it? How did, how did you know that that wasn't your best work? Uh, so you have to picture that at that point, I'd been writing fiction for whatever it was, you know, uh, 20 years or something like that. I mean, uh, even though I was only in my mid thirties, I had a meaningful amount of experience of writing fiction, but um, the vast majority of it, like for most young people was, was in short story form. And uh, the shift from a short story to a novel is is uh, a meaningful shift because it's a much it's a much more complicated mechanism, <laughs> and um, so what and I, what I sort of reflected on after the sort of failed novel was that one of the things I had not done is outline it very carefully, or really at all, and this proved to be a big problem in that uh, book. Uh, it, it was it, if you look at for those of you who've read my work, uh, hopefully you have a sense of this, uh, but different people are trying to achieve different things in the novel as an art form. One of the things that I have been trying to achieve so far 
is I'm very interested in how the novel can work together as sort of a cohesive mechanism. I think the best parallel for me is like a symphony. And if you think of you know, a fine symphony of Mozart's or Beethoven's, there is these, uh, you know, as you're listening to it, you're, you're shifting, making transitions over the course of the symphony into from different moods. Uh, so different, the notion of different musical ideas are being presented, but at the same time, there are motifs which are recurring and being replayed by different instruments, being played as a solo and then by the entire orchestra. And you have uh, moments where the music is growing quiet and then it is rising and it goes through diminuendo and then into crescendo. Uh, and then ultimately, when you get towards the end of the symphony in the best of Mozart and Beethoven, there's that feeling of like, it's all coming together for you as the listener. And finally, the sort of in the final movements, it you know it's over and you're like, yes, that was beautiful. And you, say, you don't say, you know, I really wish there were like seven more movements to that symphony. <laughs> you don't say that, you know, and nor do you say, oh, I wish this was done 15 minutes ago, right? I mean, a fine symphony comes to a conclusion when it should. And so I, I'm interested in trying to achieve this sort of same sort of experience in a novel, which is to have the motifs which are recurring, to have the transitions, to have the crescendos and diminuendos and the shifting sentiments and to have this sort of feeling like when it's done, it was just the right length and everything has come together in a way that hopefully is satisfying. And, um, and all the ideas you know, are swirling in your head or and the emotions are stimulated. That's the goal. And it is very hard to achieve that as an outcome if you don't plan the book. You know? So, so the, the unplanned novel, it was just sort of driving me crazy because as I was discovering what it was, I was shifting gears, but, but that meant that the, the, you know, the first 200 pages weren't really in harmony with what the story was becoming and where it was going. And I was constantly having to go back and try to retinker with it to make it sort of all work together. And it just never gelled. So I was like, all right, next time I'm going to do a very detailed outline. The other thing, and, I'll, and then we'll move on to this, but is I really felt in rereading the failed book that the best, some of the best parts were written in the first year. And I never even touched those parts. And some of the worst parts I had been laboring over for four years, you know, and, and I couldn't get them right. And so I sort of felt, you know, there is this element of in that first year of really going after the project where it's fresh and new and exciting and, and you, you want to make the most of that and ideally have that energy that you're feeling uh, shared with the reader and experienced by the reader uh, as much as possible. <clears throat> and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to give myself a year to write the first draft of this new book. Having outlined it, I'll give myself a year to write the first draft. For those of you who've read Rules of Civility, you may be interested in this. Uh, that book opens on New Year's Eve because I started on New Year's Eve. I, hmm. I designed it over a period of years and then I started writing chapter one on New Year's Eve. That book ends on New Year's Eve because I ended that book on New Year's Eve and in writing the first draft. And it has 26 chapters because there are 52 weeks in the year. And I wanted to write a chapter for a week, edit that chapter for a week, and then move on no matter what. Just keep moving on until I could capture. So in that first 12 months, all of the sort of the raw material of the first draft. I then had to revise that book from beginning to end three times before you know, you would have read it. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so that is, that's the way I ended up approaching rules of civility. And that, that process worked out better than the drifty seven year effort. It's interesting about the drifty seven year effort, obviously focusing full-time on writing now versus having been in the investment business, writing on the sidelines has a big impact on how much time you can focus on it. But just diving a little bit deeper on that aim more as it relates to that ability to focus and the really good work done in the first year, if you will, rather than kind of trying to get back to it further on. Do you find now that sticking to a process the way that you did there um, is, is, is where you find your genius, if you will? And I, and, and I know that's kind of a tough conversation or a tough answer, but I guess, do you right now when you're on your next project, do you plot it out exactly the same way as you did on Rules of Civility? The short answer is yes, but I want to elaborate uh, because of something you said. Uh, so yes, I, that worked so well for me that that when I set out to write A Gentleman in Moscow, I did the same thing. I spent years designing the book. I spent another year outlining the book. And the, by design, what do I mean by that? What, what My practice tends to be, I come up with a notion that intrigues me. 
Uh, but since I've been writing since I was a kid, I, I always have ideas for books or stories. And occasionally one of these ideas will really kind of grab my attention for a while. And, and I realize, okay, yeah, I want to, I want to imagine this story in greater and greater detail. And, and, you know, that's what will happen with, you know, a gentleman in Moscow, I had, a, was walking into a hotel uh, when I was in the financial field, a hotel I went to every year in Geneva, I recognized a guy in the lobby from the year before. And I thought, oh man, you know, this is a nice hotel, but can you imagine if you actually had to live in it? And that's what got me thinking, oh, what an interesting idea for a book. A guy gets trapped in a hotel for a long period of time. And um, so when I have a notion like that, which I had like a decade before a gentleman in Moscow uh, was published, I will then begin in notebooks, imagining every aspect of that story uh, that I can. You know, everything that happens, what the settings are, what the, all the individual cast of characters, their backgrounds, their personalities, what they end up doing, what they end up saying, you know, I, I, I'm sort of imagining it at all. And once I kind of know everything that's going to happen and, and the feel of it all, then I'll start a detailed outline. And then I'll go into that process that I described a minute ago. So I'll give myself, now, a gentleman in Moscow, it took me a year and a half to write the first draft. And that book is, you know, 50% longer than Rules of Civility right. for the same price. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, so it took me longer to do the first draft. But then, yeah, then I go into the editor process begins and you do the, you go from beginning to end and the beginning to end and beginning to end and until you have something. And so the, the thing I wanted to, to add, though, is because I know that you would appreciate this. And my guess is many of the people on the call would appreciate this is that I don't, having said that, that there's an aspect of the first year that I really want to capture in this sort of first drafting thing. Every aspect, every phase that I just described is extremely important to the quality of the outcome. And each of those phases is very different and its satisfactions and its demands on me as an artist. And that, what I say is this is something which I know you have experienced professionally and that your, your listeners have experienced, which is that, you know, when, when you're bringing a new financial product to market, you know, well, there's sort of an exciting phase around that. But there's all kinds of different phases around it, whether it's, you know, the design, the debugging, the marketing of it, the getting it up to scale, the, you know, building an, ex an expertise around it, refining the craft you know, diversifying it, you know, all these different elements that, that lead to uh, the ongoing pursuit of excellence, you know, all these different elements that are required towards really doing a good job in financial services of any kind, uh, that it's like there's a parallel there, right, which is that you wouldn't say as the boss, well, the most important thing is we got to get the idea right, you know, you, you do got to get the idea right, but you don't want to suggest for a second that all that other stuff that's going to come after doesn't matter. You know, you got that's going to matter just as much, if not more. And you know, it's going to get increasingly intricate and demanding from this initial kernel of an idea. Let's say so. Uh, it's, it is like that in the writing process. The the imaginative process where I'm inventing it is totally fun because it's risk free. It is zero cost. It is free floating. It's entertaining you know, comes natural to me. So that makes it easier. But so that's great. The part of actually beginning to assemble the outline is beginning to be a little bit more analytical. And I like that too. And it's that you're getting to the Rubik's Cube aspect of, of designing a novel where, you know, what's the sequence here and what is being revealed when and, and what theme is introduced when and when can this character go through this experience and when do they have this revelation? and How, how does that affect the other characters? And if I change this, you know, what's the right structure for this story to make it work? You know, this is that going on. And then there's the actual writing of, par of, of the original draft. And that's kind of exciting because it's not, doesn't exist yet. It's also a little daunting. The editing can feel like manual labor. It is manual labor, but that's really where you're really making it work, you know, <laughs> where you're taking all this great material you have and, and cleaning it up and fixing it and sharpening it and refining it. And, you know, I say that's, that's a lot of hard work, but that is uh, in a way you, you, you know, that you can't be lazy about that part. Does anybody else see it um, bef before it goes to that editing process? In other words, does Maggie read it? Um, does anybody um, else get their eyes on it before you've gone and done that sort of winnowing down process? I, 
I'm a lot of, I don't share. So huh. uh, at least in this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I going from when I have an idea and a lot designing it, outlining it, and then the writing of the first draft, I don't share it with anybody. I don't talk about the idea. I don't share the pages. And until I'm done with the first draft and I've gone through it once, you know, in a, in a sort of a light going through just to clean it up, I will then, that I will share usually with about six people in the same day. So it goes to my wife, my agent, my editor in New York, my editor in London, a couple of friends who are very good readers. Um, and I give it to them all on the same day. And I say, you know, can it would be great if you could all give me feedback in the next six weeks. And I set up a series of lunches, with the six of them, and where I basically hear what they think, you know, uh, one at a time. And, uh, you know, what did you like? What didn't you like? What was boring? What was, you know, thrilling? What was uh, confusing? What, what do you think is about to you? Um, you know, what would you change? You know, all the, whatever, which character didn't work for you, which one did. And so just sort of a whole sort of a, uh, a gathering sort of impressions from different angles. And then I kind of retreat with the feedback from those conversations. In the meantime, I've been getting my own sense of what's right and wrong about the first draft. And I'm beginning to take my own notes about how I might go about revising. What's my plan for revising the book? And I really think of it as a plan for revision, you know, and, and I start coming up with ideas. You know what? I'm going to eliminate that middle part. I'm going to kill that character. I'm going to, so I'm going to throw out the first chapter or start chapter two. And, you know, whatever you, I start coming up with a plan to make the book better. And, um, and the, as I said, these other conversations influence that strategy. And then I go into the game and dig in and, you know, go from beginning to end. And when I'm done with that, I'll give it again out to a handful of people. Maybe it's three or four, you know, and that'll be all different people except for my New York editor and my English editor who will also be in round two, you know, and then you start to move, you know, in and ideally you're having, you leave the second round of conversations with fewer things to do than the first round, you know. So you mentioned that you came up with the idea for Gentlemen in Moscow when you were in Geneva. Why did you end up picking Moscow? And there were a number of grand hotels that had all grown up at the same time. So you came up with the concept of, wouldn't it be interesting to have someone trapped in a hotel? Yes. But why'd you go to the Metropole versus going to the Ritz in Paris? Right, I got it. And you're right, the, the grand hotel, you know, between 1890 and 1910, was being built in every major capital in the world, really. It's in every major, it was in every major city in the United States. And so you could have, you could, I could have said it throughout Latin America, throughout Europe, of course, even in Asia. And uh, so at the time, um, so you, 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 I could have set the story anywhere. So, so the, the reality is that when I have a notion, like I described, guy gets trapped in a hotel for a long period of time. Uh, usually what happens is, and I'm like, oh, that's a good one. That'll be interesting. Usually what happens is within an hour, I will have some key elements of that will present themselves like that. It's really maybe even minutes. So, so in that case, probably minutes where I said, oh yeah, okay, great. I'll do it. You could do a book about a guy trapped in a hotel. You know, all I know, it'll be set in Russia. It'll be great. And uh, it'll be an aristocrat and he'll be sentenced to house arrest by the Soviets. And he'll, he'll, have, he'll be in a, the fancy hotel across the street from the Kremlin. And the story could last from the revolution all the way to the Cold War. You know, all that came to me in a matter of minutes uh, wow. with the gentleman Moscow. Now, wow. but so to the particular question is I don't, I'm not a research guy. So when that's coming to me really quickly, it's because I, already, I, I like to write out things I, have a, I already have a great deal of knowledge about or a longstanding interest in, something that I've internalized as opposed to studied. And uh, so I became a fan of the Russian novel as, you know, my 1920, you know, around that time, um, had read all the Russians closely, from the 19, the great 19th century Russians, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Turgenev, Gogol, you know, all of them, Chekhov, Chekhov ultimately. Um, and that led me to an interest in the avant-garde in Russia before the revolution, which was extremely active in all the arts. And then that led me interested in the Soviet era, the works of Solzhenitsyn. Um, so, over a 30-year time frame, I had studied Russian culture, and I had visited the country once as a result. Um, it seemed the Metropole Hotel, though I'd never been inside. And so the leap of saying, oh, yeah, great, it could be a guy set in Russia, I never would have made that leap 
if I didn't have this long, highly accumulated sense of Russian life, you know, uh, because that was sort of an excitement to me is to be able to, to take what I knew and, 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 and it made sense to me instinctively that, oh, right, you know, Soviet house arrest is a perfect way to do this story. And the clash between the Grand Hotel and the 19th century sensibility and revolutionary Russia and this forward looking, rapidly modernizing, very you know, disruptive, dangerous sort of uh, power structure, you know, all that it was sort of a, a perfect sort of way to tell this sort of grand story and about the fight of an individual in the scope of all this change. Uh, um, so that's why, you know, if I had, if I had spent 20 years reading about Latin America and uh, I probably, you know, and I'm like, oh, I'll set it in Brazil, you know, <laughs> whatever, we'll go we'll do it under Pinochet or whatever that was, you know, or, but it, but it, so it really came out of the, the comfort or my, my affinity to the material, I guess. And how much, Amor, you clearly are incredibly well read on the great Russian writers and novelists. But as you were pulling it together, how much research did you have to do to kind of go back and, if you will, refine some of your, I mean, memory of, you know, a, a Russian history class that you might have taken at Yale or whatever else is I, the, the thing that was so incredible to me in reading it was the way you weave the history into it and the specificity with which you reference the events that are going on. And, and so as one reads it, you're obviously focused on the count and the count's life and experience there, but there's so much else going around that you so incredibly weave into the story. How much of that was actually specific research versus just, you know, it's in the back of your brain, you got it and you're just applying it as you're writing this wonderful novel. Uh, I, the way I approach my work, which is different than others, but is, is I'm very wary about doing research before or while I'm writing the first draft, uh, applied research. You know, I, I don't, because uh, um, I feel that, that that kind of research, uh, that gathering of factual concrete information in the service of the story can be very detrimental to imagining the story well and bring it to life in a, in a way that has a spark in the language in the service of the reader, you know? And so I feel that I have read, you know, books. Uh, I've experienced both as a reader and as a writer, the risks of doing that kind of applied research on the front end, where you can sort of feel it being clunked, dropped down into the text you know, brand names and, you know, musical numbers from the period and what's on TV and, you know, it's Kraft macaroni and cheese was invented that year or whatever, you know, and the names of the cars and, and a celebrity on the radio and so, you know, and Kennedy was shot that day or, you know, you, it's like, wow, oh my God, you know, it, you just sort of want to push all that back and say, wait, what, 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 what's the story here? And, and so, uh, you know, you think about it, like, as you know, you think about like, you know, Kennedy gets assassinated in, you know, uh, November, or whatever. I, sh I should know off the top of my head. I don't know. Um, the point what I was going to say is you could set a story in Texas about a young girl uh, who's at odds with her mom and, uh, you know, she got a big, you know, presentation the next day in school and, and she's having a fight with her friend or whatever. And if you set that, you know, on the day that Kennedy is assassinated, the whole thing you know, doesn't make any difference what you write. You know, the story is now a part, the Kennedy assassination is a part of the story and everything in the story will be in, you know, in conjunction with what happened later that day or earlier that day. And, and you know, and, and, and now all the characters are gonna have to talk about it too, you know. Um, but so you, you have to be very careful also in terms of picking these things that you bring in from the historical record into a narrative because they become the narrative very quickly if they're prominent, right? So, so, I, I don't like to do the research. I like to imagine the thing fully. And yes, you're absolutely right, Willie, that I, I do not start that process remembering the day Lenin died. I have a rough sense of the year, maybe, you know? And I don't totally remember, you know, the, when, you know, when, when they, uh, you know, certain aspects of the constitution, but I remember generally some of the, you know, the, the problems that were created for society by virtue of rules and regulations or whatever. So, so I'll, I'll go on the seat of my pants a little bit. I'll say, I'll take that general awareness and I'll use a lot of X's in, in the narrative as necessary, you know? 
And uh, maybe when I'm plotting out the outline, I'll just double check, wait, what's the year that Lenin died so that I don't make sure that's so it's in the right chapter or whatever. But, but everything else gets pushed back. And, um, and when I'm done with the first draft, then I'll actually, I'll start to go on and do some more, some applied research. And I will, uh, I'll even have you, kept a list. You went and spent a week at the Metropole after you'd done the first draft, right? Most important example is I had never spent a night in the Metropole Hotel when I wrote the book. And when I finished the first draft, I got on a plane, flew to Moscow, moved into the hotel, into the Count's suite at the opening of the book with my first draft and began revising while I was there. And the other thing I did uh, is I had I realized that the Metro Hotel was really one of the only fine hotels in Russia throughout 1900 to 1970, really. And you know it was the National, the Savoy, and the Metropole. So in this sort of six to seven decade span, uh, if a famous person came to Moscow, they either drank at, ate at, or slept at the Metropole. That's just basically a reality of life. And so I realized that you could go out and find memoirs of significant Americans who had visited Moscow in any of the decades between the revolution and the Cold War. And if you went through the index, the Metropole was often there. So I started, you know, even when I, I started a gathering them. So as I was getting near the end of the first draft, I started accumulating firsthand accounts of events in the hotel. John Steinbeck uh, in his memoirs talks about his experiences in the hotel. Lillian Hellman, the great Pulitzer Prize winning playwright who you know, was Dashiell Hammett's lover, uh, she writes about it. Um, uh, John Reed, you know, the great American who wrote the 10 Days That Shook the World, writes about uh, the Metropole Hotel. So this whole, whole E.E. E. Cummings, the poet does. Now, in addition, I realized and sort of discovered that journalists, all the journalists wrote about it because the, uh, the international press office was about a block from the Metropole because they wanted to keep it close. It was right in between the Kremlin and the KGB office. That's where the international press office was, you betcha. And so uh, the, the closest bar to the national, international press office was basically the bar at the Metropole. So for 50 years, that's where they all drank. And so uh, you could just kind of go, you could just pick in decade 20s, the 30s, the 40s, any British or American journalist who wrote a memoir, and they all did, uh, you could get, you know, uh, anecdotes from the Metropole. So I, ga I gathered all this, Xeroxed it all, had a big stack, flew to Moscow, moved into the hotel, began reading through those and began planning the revision for the book. Uh, and that was totally fun. So... There's a, there's a story that I've heard you tell, and um, I'm not going to ask you to tell it again, because there are a number of listeners who've probably heard you tell it before, about Harrison Salisbury and Harrison Salisbury being on Martha's Vineyard and finding a bottle that you'd put into the ocean, thinking that it was going to make its way to China, and it ended up going around from West Chop to East Chop. Yeah. Um, but you work Harrison Salisbury, who was a, a writer for the New York Times, who was stationed in Moscow, into it, where yeah. at the end, the count... Um, I don't want to give the story away to anyone who has not read the book, but as the Count is is uh, uh, going to try and uh, steal a, uh, a coat and a fedora, it's Harrison Salisbury's coat and fedora, which you've worked into the to the uh, to the theme. Exactly. But as I was also researching that, I also realized that your father was known for wearing his fedora. Yes. And walking down the street in Boston and sitting outside of the Brown Brothers Harriman office and and just sitting there and talking to people as they would go in and out of the building. And yeah. so was that literally and figuratively a tip of the hat to your dad at the same time as you were mentioning Harrison Salisbury? Yeah, you know, I think so. And, and also, you know, Bogart plays a big role in uh, uh, General Moscow. I mean, the movie Casablanca does and, and Bogart uh, to some degree. Another famous fedora wearer, of course. And my father was a big Bogart fan. And I grew up watching the Bogart movies with my dad at the, at the double feature houses in Cambridge. Um, so yeah, there's clearly a, some sort of a, a, you know, sort of thread of the, of the fedora, which, which my, my father is very much a part of, um, you know, and of course, you know, Sinatra, I'm a big Sinatra fan is a big fedora wear. So yeah, uh, th th there's, that's definitely true. And as you say, yes, uh, Salisbury, Adding this guy who I had met, you know, corresponded with as a child, met when I was 18, you know, he had been the Moscow bureau chief of the Times, had written extensively about the Metropole. I didn't remember any of that about him being in Russia until kind of as I would begin gathering materials. But so I carried his memoirs with me to Russia. And, you know, I was there in, in the hotel, I open up his memoirs, and the first page is 
you know, I got in the, you know, the taxi and I told him to take me to the Metropole Hotel because that's where Salisbury lived while he was the Moscow bureau chief. And um, so he talks about it a lot. And in the revision of A Gentleman in Moscow, I, I began to incorporate uh, some material that were kind of sprang out of his memoirs and ultimately, as you say, put him, his actual person in the book, you know, as a tribute, I guess. So I, the, the fact about the, the actual research and not letting it impact the way you create the story is fascinating and waiting until you've got the first draft to go back and do that. As I was, as I read all of your books, the vocabulary you use, Amor, is astounding. And, um, I know you're A, an incredibly well-read person and B, you have an amazing vocabulary. But I'm just curious whether you ever pick up the thesaurus to put in a word. So for instance, in, in, uh, as the count is sitting there looking at his room and describing the grandfather clock, uh, you write, it sloped asymptotably from top to bottom. And so my question is, was asymptotably just a word in your mind or was, was the thesaurus, did the thesaurus come in there as you were trying to describe the clock? Uh, no, I, I did not. I don't know how you would use a thesaurus to find that word. Yeah, I, I don't either. But Where I'm sitting there going, start? how did he come up with that word? Slope, you know, asymptotically, asymptotically. Uh, Sorry you know, for the pronunciation. Uh, so, you know, uh, but I, you know, I studied geometry, right? You know, I remember you know, the asymptote is where, you know, moves and gets closer and closer and closer without ever touching the line, right? So, so I sort of had this, oh yeah, all right, that's what the shape looks like, you know? And you're like, dude, you can describe the, this, this clock, you can describe it like, you know, the, the, a woman on her side, the sort of her hip, you know, and I didn't, I didn't sound like the count, but asymptotically sounded more like the count. Um, no, I don't use these sources. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny, no one's ever asked me that. And I've never used one really in my life. And I, but I, I partly I don't use them for the reason, it's the same thing as the research. Yeah. I feel like when you read someone who writes with these thesaurus, you can usually tell, you know, there's something like, They've taken some word to replace another word that isn't quite right, and you know, or it's a little off, or or you know, something. So it's either more high flute than it should be, or not enough flute. <laughs> but anyway, so, so I, you know, if it doesn't, I, I have to trust what sounds right to my ear. But a big difference in my work compared to some others is that I'm very interested in tone and point of view. And, uh, and how it shapes the reading experience and the understanding of the human mind uh, for the reader when considering a character. So for me, if you read A Gentleman in Moscow, if you read The Lincoln Highway, if you read Rules of Civility, my hope, my sincere hope would be that you, you find them to be very different linguistically. You know, that the Gentleman in Moscow sounds like a 19th century aristocrat who's very refined and has sort of a big opinion of himself. Whereas, you know, rules of civility sounds like, you know, a young woman in, from a working class background in, you know, New York in the 30s, you know, they had, and that means, and Emmett, you know, this young Midwesterner in the 1950s who opens the Lincoln Highway, the, the, the actual writing for each of those three characters is very different intentionally. And I want, so, so the vocabulary uh, has to in a way spring from my sense of their personality and as well as sort of their upbringing. But what would they say? How would they put it? What would sound right to them, you know? And, uh, and again, like in a way the thesaurus is, the, is not gonna help me with that. You know, right. I have to hear that person in a way that's organic and natural so that it's, oh yeah, that's exactly how that, how she would put that, how he would put that. And, uh, and that's, that's a big part of the, the art as it were, um, but, um, but it, it comes from the practice of trying to imagine how different people sound, and, not in dialogue. Yeah, and and on then the next area is how much of your writing is pulled from your own personal experience versus what you're creating in your own mind. And uh, as I think about the young girl Nina in uh, *Gentlemen in Moscow*, how much of Nina is reflective of your daughter Esme? Very little. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I'll tell anecdotes saying that, you know, Esme, and this is true, you know, is sort of a, having the father of a you know, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old girl, that's where you may, you realize how shrewd a little girl can be, you know, <laughs> and that was helpful as kind of, you know, as I was inventing the Nina and Sophia in Gentleman Moscow, um, 
but but beyond that, there was there's no aspect of my daughter's personality which is reflected in Sophia's or Nina's, uh, who themselves are very different uh, people. Um, and I so I don't really use, uh, you know, nobody in the Lincoln Highway is based on someone I know. Um, so it, I do uh, invent the people kind of from scratch. It's really the way that works for me. And the I've heard you tell the story about La Principessa. Um, and uh, your daughter uh, showing up at Smith, Smith and Walensky's and uh, um, yeah. asking them to treat her as the, uh, as the way she used to be treated at the local Italian restaurant around the corner yeah. from the wall. So there are, if you will, there are pieces of a nine-year-old girl and the way that she's acting that influence the way that you're describing what Nina is like in the book, but it's not sitting there and saying, I'm going to base this off of Esme and the way she lives her life. Is that, is that a fair... Yeah, and, and it's even, you know, you, you couldn't even say, oh, I'm going to take, you know, Willie's sense of charm and, and you know, and Taylor's this and, you know, and so-and-so is that and put them together and make a person because you can't do that either, you know. So, so you really have to kind of sort of start with, you, you have a sense. And, and again, and, I, and this is, I think, um this is one of the more mysterious aspects of the writing process, I suppose, or one of the ones that's more, more difficult to articulate. And it may be because it is principally through decades of practice that it has become second nature for me. But when I'm imagining, let's say the Lincoln Highway, and there's gonna be these three 18 year old boys who are interacting right from you know, chapter one. And one is born in the Midwest and you know, one is from a rougher section of New York in, nine, in the early, you know, this is in the mid fifties. One is from an aristocratic sort of uh, Upper East Side upbringing in uh, New York. It's, and I kind of know that very early. And then you start to get into what, what do they sound like? Who, who are these people? That is a part, that's where it's, as I say, I don't reach outside to look at somebody. I sort of listen in. And then you kind of get this sort of um, cycle of where you're saying, okay, you know, yeah, you know, Emmett would be, he'd be the kind of kid who, X, you know, right early on, okay, you know what's going to happen? He's going to get in a fight. He's going to kill somebody by mistake. And he's going to bear the sense of guilt like that. And, you know, and I, early in the first chapter of Lincoln Highway, I, I, that the premise of the Lincoln Highway, excuse me, so an 18 year old is being on the opening day, well, well a, a younger a teenager uh, gets into a fight at the county fair in uh, Nebraska in the mid 50s, punches a kid who's a bully. The bully falls back, hits his head, and dies. And our hero is sent away to a work farm, juvenile work farm. The book then opens the day the warden is driving him home, Emmett to the family farm. And in the meantime, his father has died, the farm's in bankruptcy. And the warden is saying, you know, you've paid your debt to society, you're a good person, an honorable person, you know, you should start your life anew. And the hero you know, says, that's my intention. But when the warden drives away, it turns out that these two other kids from the work farm have hidden in the trunk of the car, and they have this sort of different vision of how to spend the near future. And that's when everything sort of starts in the case of the Lincoln Highway. Well, <clears throat> so imagining Emmett, and I know this, as I say, I already know this and right off the bat, this is what the story is going to be, is that I, you know, as I'm beginning to imagine Emmett, I, you know, I, I had early on this sort of thing of, uh, the warden saying, you know, you paid your debt to society and, you know, uh, you, you, know you, can, you should start your knife fresh. And then Emmett would say to himself, um, in essence, that whatever he'd done, whatever to pay the debt, it wasn't enough yet. And in fact, you know, when you kill another person, uh, you, you shouldn't be able to pay that back unless, you know, until it takes you the rest of your life. You know, basically, this is the notion that this young person would have that that to make up for this error is going to be a lifelong project you know and uh and so once I, I you know i hear that i'm like oh yeah that's the guy he is you know that that you know doing time wasn't enough and and uh and you know that that he's he's entering his life with carrying this debt and uh and and he's going to be paying for it again and again and again and again you know and without a bitterness but with a feeling like that's the way it should be, you know, and then there's sort of a sense of sort of really stoic, practical, hard edged honor in that. So as I say, so this is a cycle where I'm like, oh yeah, okay, that's the guy. And that means that he would do this. And then like, oh yeah, okay. 
Because you're right, that's a different aspect of his character. And oh, good thing, because then he would do that. You say, oh, okay, yeah. And you get you get a better and better sense of the, the, the dimensionality of the individual. This is all before writing. And so the character. And, uh, and you know, because, oh, okay, well, how does he feel about his mother? How does she fit into this? And you sort of think that through and, and you go back and revisit your assumptions so far and tinker with them. And, and you get closer and closer and closer. I'm doing this, but what I really should be doing is moving inward, you know? which is getting, you're getting closer to this is the person. And then hopefully that comes also with a sense of, as I said, what they sound like. You know, not simply, not simply how they would talk, but how they would think when they walked into a room, what they'd observe, how they'd say it to themselves, how they'd reflect upon it later, you know, which is very different than dialogue. I'm in a way more important than dialogue. And uh, so, but yeah, this is all part of the process of inventing the individuals. On, on that, um, I believe that you originally had the book uh, titled Unfinished Business and then changed it to Lincoln Highway. Why did you make that shift? Um, so the book was called Inf Unfinished Business and some kind of related in a way to what I was just saying about Emmett. So this idea of these things that you do and they open up this ledger that you're, you know, you're, you're trying to bring to conclusion. And meanwhile, his buddy from New York is a grudge guy. <laughs> And so, you know, he's got unfinished business of a different kind. He wants to go and, you know, uh, get paid back for, you know, what the people have done to him. And, um, and so that's kind of where I began. Parenthetical note here, years and years ago, uh, you know, when I had this idea for this book and began designing it, you know, that, that was on the cover of my, you know, uh, notebooks. You know, this is back in, um, let's say, the mid, maybe two, 2014 or something like that. And then... Um, uh, what's the name? Was it Vince Vaughn? Ends up having a movie called Unfinished Business. And I was like, oh man, you know, <laughs> definitely not going to use it now. I mean, I didn't invent that phrase, but, but you know, I, I certainly didn't want the thing popping up on a Google search alongside Vince Vaughn. I'm a huge fan of Vince Vaughn's. But anyway, so that aside, uh, what ended up happening is that uh, in the Lincoln Highway, the book, uh, the characters are supposed to, they're going to, the main character and his brother are going to go to California. Right. The two interlopers from New York City and from, I mean, from the trunk of the car convinced them, in essence, to go east to New York. And, uh, you know, that's where they head. Uh, and the whole story is a 10-day, you know, series of events. Um, in my notes, it, it always just said, you know, they're going to go out, the, take a right out of the farm and head east on Route X. And I'd begun writing the book in earnest, and it was still kind of Route X. And, um, and I designed the whole thing. And but finally, I got to the point where I was like, you know, I got I got to go back and and look more closely at the road they're going to take because it's going to influence what they're going to see and what city they might stop in and blah blah blah. blah. And so I open up a map of the Midwest and I'm looking at. It, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's the right route from this town in Nebraska, ten miles north onto that route, go straight, you know, east, and it's Route 30. And in small print, it said formerly known as the Lincoln Highway. And I was like, oh, what's that, you know? And so this is a case where I was like, all right, set this aside. Wait, just go figure out what the Lincoln Highway is. And, uh, and then everything I learned about the Lincoln Highway, I was like, oh, this place, this is crazy. This is amazing. And, um, and you know, changed the title of the book like that. And the Lincoln Highway is the first highway to cross America. Mm -hmm. And very strangely, in, in terms of modern sensibilities, uh, for us to imagine, it was built by an individual. It was an entrepreneur. A guy who had uh, made uh, the equivalent of $100 million by inventing the first all-weather headlight for cars uh, called the Presto Lamp. He sold it to Union Carbide. He sold his company to Union Carbide in 1911. Uh, and then he, he, he built the international, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He launched the Indy 500. He discovered Miami Beach. Uh, back in, you know, the 1915, he was vacationing in Miami with his wife as a rich man, and everybody lived in, on the, the Biscayne Bay. Miami goes up to the Biscayne Bay, and then across the bay, there was a barrier island and then the ocean. And the barrier island was nothing. It was farmland and scrub. <clears throat> and then he went out there and built the Flamingo Hotel and created Miami Beach. So he was a sort of unbelievable American guy. And uh, but, so one of the things he did is he's like, you know what? There should be a road that crosses America. It's crazy. There's no road that crosses America. And in 1915, there were 2 million miles of road in the United States, and 95% uh, of them were unpaved. And he's like, it's good. there should be a paved road, and there were no roads across America. You know, what would happen is, like, if you left, if you went west of Pittsburgh, let's say, 
the roads from Pittsburgh would sort of peter out into the countryside where people lived, you know, and then there'd be like, you know, but there was no road to go from Pittsburgh to Denver, right? right? The trains went from Pittsburgh to Denver. So he was like, we're going to have one connected road. And so he built it. He raised money, uh, put in his own money and, you know, uh, starts in Times Square and ends in Lincoln Park in San Francisco and goes almost straight across the country, he goes through 12 of the states. And in, you know, he built it in 1915. And this is kind of an interesting aside. It was so hard to drive across the country uh, in 1912 that only 100 people did it. Uh, literally 100 people. And uh, he built the Lincoln. And, and keep in mind, there was no gas stations, no hotels. Right. So yeah. you, you an expedition. You, you, you drove across the country. You look at the pictures. It was like a polar expedition. You had gas, water, tools, mm -hmm. tents, food, you know, goggles, you know, all that. And so he built the Lincoln Highway. And uh, two years later, 20,000 Americans drove across the country. Like wow. that. And so by 1918, it was the most famous road in America by far. It's the most famous road in America in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. And, uh, and when the 1950s came, Eisenhower built the interstate highway system and made it obsolete. Right. So anyway, I was like, oh, yeah, this is amazing. And, you know, none of that's in the book. But I was like, yeah, no, what, it's, a great, it's, what a great symbol. What a great so symbol. Fun, so fun. And, I, and I, would, I would only recommend to people who are listening that what Amor just went into as it relates to Lincoln Highway there are a number of interviews he's done around gentlemen in Moscow that gives the backstory of what was happening in Russia at the time, which you, you, you don't fully, well, you don't get it in the book. The narrative in the book is amazing and you're watching the life of, of, of Count Rostov, but there's so much behind it that Amor goes into as it relates to what was happening of the seat of power moving from St. Petersburg back to Moscow and a bunch of other things on why the hotel was being used for meetings of the Communist Party that is well worth people to take the time to listen to because he's so insightful on the broader topics going on that all informed his writing. Um, you. Amor, and you can find all that on YouTube for sure. Yeah, you can, exactly. Um, I want to just talking about editing, um, you get a lot of feedback and you're incredible at taking the feedback in. And my understanding is that when people come up with some particular comment about something that you might not have gotten exactly right at the time period, that when you go from hardback to paperback, you actually go in and make adjustments to it. And I just wanted you to give the two anecdotes that I've heard you tell before, one on the bees and gentlemen, and the other on the goalposts in yeah. Lincoln Highway. So in Gentleman Moscow, there's sort of a meaningful scene early in the book where the count goes to the roof of the building. His intention is to throw himself off the roof. And it, he runs into an old beekeeper, uh, an old uh, main, and a maintenance guy who keeps bees on the roof and makes honey. And they end up having this lovely conversation where they're, you know, tasting the, the, the honey. And, and uh, the count sort of observes, says, hey, you know, the, the honey tastes like the lilacs in the Alexander Gardens, which border the uh, Kremlin. And he says, yeah, because that's the way, they, you know, that's the way bees work. You know, the, the boys go out to the lilac and when they come back, the honey tastes like lilac. And when the boys go out to the cherry blossoms, they come back and the honey tastes like cherry blossoms. And yes, yeah, so when a book goes out in the modern age, uh, you know, you go to amortolls.com, you, you send a, go to the contact page, it comes right to me. <laughs> you can reach me. And, you know, in the modern era, it takes about seven days for the errors in your book to start coming through uh, email, you know, which is a lot of fun. And so... <laughs> But one of them, some of them are great. And so, but I, I, the lovely woman writes to me and she says, you know, I love, you know, I love your book. Jenna Moscow really moved me. But she says, but I think you should know that as a, a uh, keeper of bees that um, the boy bees do not go out to the lilacs and come back, you know, when the honey's made. It's the girl bees who do that. You know, the boy bees don't go anywhere. And I was like, right, <laughs> excuse me. So I fixed that going from hardcover to paperback, you know, and. And uh, in the case of the Lincoln Highway, uh, Wooly, this very, I hope, endearing character who hates thesauruses, by the way, <laughs> you know, that's probably where yeah. that comes from, is he, he, he's, he, he goes on about the problems with the thesauruses. He loves a dictionary, but he hates a thesaurus. And so he, he goes out in the football field around Thanksgiving and he, to burn his, thank, his thesaurus, you know, using gas off of the crew coach's, you know, launch. And, uh, but the, it, it gets out of control, the fire gets out of control and he describes the fire and he steps back, the fire goes, you know, up the center post of the, of the, uh, the, the goal post and then out along the arms and the whole thing looks like a man with his arms raised on fire. And, 
And so, yes, very quickly, I received the note that, you know, well, <laughs> your book is very good, but, and I love that scene, I love Wooly, but you should know that in 1954, the football goal pit post did not look like a Y, it looked like an H. <laughs> so, yes, you know, I went back and, and made, uh, you know, some minor changes to the language there to bring that, you know, to tighten that up in, in uh, reality. So, and, and I will certainly hunt for that stuff before, the book is published and uh, and I'll kind of exit the the first draft or even the second draft with a list of 30 things I want to double check. But no matter how carefully you do that, there's always something you're it doesn't even occur to you is, you know, is off, you know, by a decade or more or whatever. So so people do provide some help on that. And one you mentioned 1954. You end gentlemen in Moscow in June of 54. Uh, and uh, Lincoln Highway begins in June of 54. Yeah. Um, and the house where you are in right now in upstate New York is both in Rules of Civility as well as Lincoln Highway. Is there anything My, else? This house is go, yeah, well, a, a stone house on the side of a lake that looks a lot like where you are right now is, is in both. Is right. there anything else anymore that runs through either one or two or potentially all three there are of many, the novels? There are many things. <laughs> and I would not tell you them all. Um, but, but I mean, but there's some big ones. Any 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 close reader of my work, particularly if you've read the book, you know, in a relatively short period of time, you'd know. Dickie Vanderweil is a character in Rules of Civility. He is a, a, a meaningful character in Rules of Civility. He's a meaningful character in A Gentleman in Moscow. Right. But uh, it, where Rules of Civility is 1938, and Dickie is unemployed and 25 and right out of college and kind of devil may care. At the end of Rules of Civility, it says in the epilogue that when the war begins. He ends up going into the Navy and becomes an officer and, you know, uh, does a great job and ends up working in the State Department. And in General Moscow, he appears after the Second World War uh, as a, an attache to a general uh, who's, you know, because, of course, we were allies with Russia at the time. And um, but then he keeps he, he appears throughout the 50s in a General in Moscow, ultimately at the State Department where he's, of course, a CIA operative. Um, but uh, so he's in both books, uh, in Lincoln Highway and Rules of Civility, the family, the Wolcott family is very central. Uh, the house that they own in the Adirondacks appears in both books. Uh, Will, Wallace Wolcott in Rules of Civility, his nephew is in Lincoln Highway. A watch that uh, is, it plays an important role in Rules of Civility is then handed down uh, and ends up in the Lincoln Highway. Um, so there's, you know, things like that that are going on here and there. It's great. Um, we're coming to the end here. I've got, I've got two quick final ones. First of all, um, the, the fame and fortune that comes with being a best-selling writer. Um, been really fun to go on Seth Meyers' show and, and be on national television answering questions about your writing or kind of something that, yeah, it's neat, but just, you know, was never anything I really was hoping to get to. So just kind of do it as part of the job. Um, you know, uh, there are definitely, you know, fringe benefits around, you know, how you, were your book being, uh, reaching, you know, the, the audience, Seth Myers was a fan and that's how I end up on the show. And that's, you know, it's so, so and I'm a Seth Myers fan, you know, and I, and, and I, you know, I, you know, I met, Tom Hanks, because he was a fan, you know, and I, I mean, I've met George W. Bush because he was a fan. And, you know, people, you know, I met Jackson Brown, you know, which he asked me to come see his show at the Beacon because he was a fan. So that's amazing, right? But, you know, uh, as fun as all that is, of course, you know, that that's, as an artist, what is, uh, what's particularly moving and why you're in it is, is for your work to reach readers, you know, and, uh, and so I would, I'd be writing whether the books were successful or not. I'd be writing, you know, uh, you know, I'd be happy to write for 10,000 people instead of a million, what, you know, whatever. It's, it's nice to have it be a bigger group who, who finds your book meaningful to them, your work meaningful to them. But the, but the biggest satisfactions really are that knowing that the book is finding an audience, that it's resonating with people, that it's made an impact in their lives in some interesting way. You know, uh, I've been, you know, written by, uh, you know, a gentleman in Moscow about a person, you know, who's trapped in a hotel. You know, I've had people write me about, um, you know, going through serious illness where they couldn't leave their room for a year, you know, and, and how the book affected them or helped them go through this confinement. That happened during COVID. You know, people wrote me, particularly people who lived alone and, you know, suddenly couldn't see their families and 
didn't have friends and, you know, and who turned to the book as a companion to get them through COVID and, and sort of thinking about the count. Um, and, you know, and that's, I've had people write me for Eastern Europe about General Moscow to say, you know, what uh, life was like for them during the, you know, the Soviet era, you know, and, uh, and when what they went through and, and the, you know, the appreciation of seeing the struggles of an individual under the, the you know, the Soviet uh, umbrella. Uh, so, you know, that's really, of course, what, what you're, what, and, and I have, you know, I read it to my husband or I've given it to my daughter or, you know, I, you know we, we, we did it as a family. We were discussing the book as a family, discussing Lincoln Avenue. That's really what's exciting. You know, you yeah. do the work and you hope that it resonates with people. And, uh, you know, that, that's, you know, to have people come back to you to tell you this is what the book meant to me is, is you know, that's the most satisfying thing of all. So looping back to where we started about fashioning a life, I've heard you use the quote that Keith Richards gave when he and Mick Jagger were walking down the street in the town where the two of them grew up together. And his quote is, I imagined it all, I just didn't think it would happen. Yeah. Um, did you think this would happen? No, I, I, I tell that story because because I felt the same way. I mean, not that I'm Keith Richards, but but that that yeah, because you know, because what happens is a young woman, a, a woman that's a, a peer of Keith's, and makes a friend from childhood, sees them when they're famous, and she says, Keith, you know, oh man, rock star, rock, travel around the world. Could you ever have imagined? You know, that's what prompts the answer. And he says, Oh, I imagined it all. I just never thought it was going to happen. And there is an element to that. I've, I've wanted to write fiction since I was a kid. So yes, in, in, in ways of, in, with delusions of grandeur, I imagined it all, you know, and, uh, but I just never thought it was going to happen. Um, but then eventually you get a book out and it goes into the world and, you know, and, and now it's, it's, now it's, a, it's part of my job. Yeah, it's just great. Amor, I'm so happy and thankful for you to take the time. Um, thank you. You've been extremely generous with it. Um, congrats on all you've done. Uh, look thank forward you. to seeing you sometime soon and uh, my best to your family. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. Appreciate Take it. Take care, Amor. See you. Bye.